Back in August, I made a video about the Kingdom Hearts 1 novel, the first in a series of novelizations for each game in the Kingdom Hearts series written by Tomiko Kanemaki. In that video, I gave my thoughts on the general concept of novelizing Kingdom Hearts, so I won't repeat all of that now, you can check out that first video here if you'd like. But I had a lot of fun going through the novel version of my favorite video game and reporting back on all the different changes and choices that were made. And I've been in something of a Chain of Memories mood lately, and the Chain of Memories novel has been sitting on my desk since Christmas, so inspiration struck me like Xemnas' truck struck the side of a building. Even before reading the first page, I assumed that Chain of Memories would make for a better book than KH1 despite my enjoying the first game, Leagues More. That's not to say that Calm is bad though, in fact I've always quite enjoyed it, especially its original GBA version, but always mainly for its story and character work. I've got another video for you if you want to hear me gush about the game a bit from back in the channel's earlier days. But given Calm's first iteration as an entirely text-based story that focused a lot more on dialogue and the interpersonal relationships between characters, I think it lends itself to novelization a bit more easily, or at least it feels more natural than the KH1 novel did. But while I think Chain of Memories makes for a better book, I'm not sure if it makes for a more interesting read, if that makes sense. I think KH1, as a game that spent less time on extended dialogue sequences, sort of necessitated a bit more stuff being filled in and created to justify its novelization, whereas I think Chain of Memories didn't require as much of the same treatment. And as someone who's played all of these games far too many times, Okay, most of the games. I'm opening these novels hoping to see at least a moderate degree of deviation to spice things up. Otherwise, I'm just experiencing the game again but with a much lower amount of Shimamura tunes and a much higher risk of paper cuts, which the Calm novel pretty much felt like at times. And don't get me wrong, there were changes here and there, you might be able to tell from looking at the video's runtime that we'll be going over them in great detail, but I think I found myself more entertained or amused by the variations in the KH1 novel than most of the Calm novel. I say most of because there's a major exception in the third volume which I think was actually the peak of my novel reading experiences between both of the KH books I've read so far. Before I get into breaking down all of the differences between the game and the novel, I should give some background information that might be helpful to know. The Chain of Memories novel was originally published in three separate parts in Japanese. Volume 1, which covered the first half of Sora's story, included a prologue and five chapters. This came out in Japan on October 22nd, 2005, aka my ninth birthday. Volume 2 covered the rest of Sora's story, featuring six chapters, one short chapter, and an epilogue, and that released about a month later on November 30th, 2005. Finally, Volume 3 covered Reverse Rebirth, Riku's unlockable campaign from the game, which included a prologue, eight chapters, and an epilogue. This last part came out on January 31st, 2006. The version of the novel I've got is the English translation of all three volumes in one book, released on September 22nd, 2015. As you probably could have guessed, the Chain of Memories novel is a good bit longer than its predecessor, 400 pages to KH1's 276. This is largely due to that third volume covering Riku's story, as without it, the novels would have been roughly the same length. You may have noticed that the novel was originally written prior to the release of Recom and Cage 2 Final Mix in 2007. Because of this, the novel often stays true to how events played out in the GBA version. For example, the way Lexius' death scene plays out and the lack of a proper fight against Zexion or a third Marluxia form. However, the English translation came out several years after Recom. Interestingly, in many cases, dialogue is often more reflective of the Recom lines than the original GBA ones, but with some notable exceptions. You also might be wondering how Chain of Memories handles the worlds that it depicts given the cuts made in the KH1 novel, namely Olympus Coliseum, Atlantica, Halloween Town, and the 100 Acre Wood. Well, those first three remain cut in addition to losing Deep Jungle, which never made it past KH1 in the games, but was depicted in its novelization, surprisingly. Oh, because of one mishap. Come now. 100 Acre Wood, however, does appear with its own full chapter in this Calm novel, despite Sora never visiting the world in the KH1 novel. Lastly, before getting into the novel proper, the Calm novel, like KH1's before it, provides some fun little character bios at the start of the book, with a few repeats given that they appeared at the start of each of the three volumes. One sort of odd thing I noticed in the bios was in Zexian's, which refers to him as something of a leader to Lexius and Vexen, even though he's the least senior member of the three, though I suppose he's the guy coming up with all the plans during Riku's story. The bios are accompanied by really charming illustrations by Shiro Amano like in the first game's book, and there are a few black and white pictures spread throughout the chapters with a handful of color drawings in the front of the book. I'll show off any relevant illustrations when we get to its respective part. So let's get to it, shall we? Like in the KH1 novel video, I'll be presenting my observations in something of a bullet point fashion just so we're not here all day. It's not going to be my most elegant prose. So without further ado... 
The page before the prologue features something of a nomine monologue. These will continue in between the chapters for the rest of Sora's story, offering some thoughts from Nomine's perspective after each world. They're written a bit more poetically and more fragmented than the rest of the book, and it's all entirely original to the novel. The novel's gonna spend a lot more time on both Nomine and especially the Riku replica, which I definitely appreciated. The prologue just covers the scene of SDG chasing Pluto and Sora meeting a hooded Marluxia at night. At the start of chapter 1, we get another page from Nomine's perspective, who comments on heroes both above and below, referring to Sora and Riku. And I've gotten into the weeds with this multiple times on my Twitch channel, but it really seems like she's literally trapped in a birdcage. Not just her doll, which you might remember sitting in a birdcage in the game's opening, I mean like actual Nomine. The novel never mentions a doll, and this page says, I wonder if I'll ever get to meet them, murmured a flaxen-haired girl in a white dress, she sat in a birdcage. Now, like, I understand metaphor, but to me, it really seemed as if they were saying she's literally sitting in a birdcage. But this birdcage never gets mentioned again, so I guess it's just symbolic. Upon arriving at Castle Oblivion, Sora comments that it's even bigger than Hollow Bastion. And like, is it? I guess it's kind of hard to compare them side by side, but I always would have assumed Hollow Bastion was bigger. Regardless, it's fun to see it referenced here since there will be a whole conversation later about how SDG explored a castle that they forgot the name of. When Marluxia shows up, Donald tries to cast Tier 3 spells like Faraga, Blazaga, and Thundaga instead of the Tier 1 spells he casts in the game. It does make more sense this way, since there's no reason for him to think he wouldn't be able to cast more powerful magic at this point. Of course, it still doesn't work, like in the game. Marluxia, like in the game, phases through Sora to appear at the top of the stairs to Traverse Town. The narration remarks, It was a strange sensation being passed through. It also comments that it felt familiar to Sora, maybe referencing Kairi in the secret place in KH1. When Marluxia tosses the card to Sora, the trio recognizes Traverse Town by name. Sort of unrelated, but this made me realize that no one ever says the name of the world out loud in KH1, only a few times in text bubbles. Anyway, the narration comments that the card showed a familiar view of the town that the trio had seen from the gummy ship in The Other Sky. In the KH1 novel, the phrase Ocean Between was always used when referring to gummy space, so I thought it was worth mentioning. After talking with Marluxia again in the fake Traverse Town, the narration recalls that the trio had met a man in a black coat in Hollow Bastion, referring to the Xemnas fight from Final Mix, which was depicted in the KH1 novel. I guess despite one of them speaking through white text and one of them having a voice, they still can't tell if they're the same person, judging by what the novel says. There was one thing they were sure of, men in black coats kept telling them confusing things. Soon after, Heartless show up and the trio tries to fight them. Donald remarks that he literally can't fight without his magic, so I guess he doesn't even try bonking them with his staff like he does in the games. He tries casting Faraga again, which fails, and then Fyra, which also fails, but manages to succeed at casting Fire. So by this point, it's apparent that the novel thankfully won't be shoving Donald and Goofy away in a card pocket dimension since that'd make for a pretty lonely book. You also probably could have guessed that Sora won't be shown grinding for area cards and exploring pseudo-random isometric rooms. You can just imagine the worlds here as they appeared in Cage 1, with the world's inhabitants not locked behind some key to beginnings card. Speaking of, Leon shows up after the trio finally defeats the Heartless. The scene is largely similar to how it plays out in the game, except taking place in the first district instead of the third, as well as Leon drawing his gun blade as he insists that he's never met SDG before. And they're all like, whoa, holy fuck dude, that is such an overreaction. After Yuffie shows up and everyone talks, Leon begins leading SDG to the second district hotel instead of the small house like in the game. I guess in an attempt to replicate the tutorial fight where Leon teaches Sora about slights in the game, Sora proposes fighting Leon recalling the first time they fought in KH1. Donald and Goofy try to join in, but Sora asks to fight alone since that's how it went the first time. Leon's like, uh, okay, I guess, and easily defeats Sora, just like what happened in the first novel. After leaving the hotel where they had a conversation with Aerith, SDG have an additional conversation while walking through the second district. Goofy ponders that if the town and the Final Fantasy crew are illusions created by Sora's memories, maybe he and Donald are illusions too, which has gotta be one hell of an existential crisis. They get swarmed by Heartless again, and while initially lacking confidence, Sora reminds them that they are only as weak as they were when they first met. After the fight, they comment on how they feel stronger just from that battle, which I guess is referencing leveling up, as Donald says he can use Blizzard again. Everything involving the trio's meeting with Sid and the guard armor showing up is pretty much the same. Donald is reluctant about fighting, but Sora reasons that even though they're not as strong as they used to be, they already fought the guard armor together once, and Goofy adds that they know how to fight together, so they must be at least a little stronger than when they first met. They then defeat the guard armor with no issue. After the battle, they try to go through the fire door in the 3rd district, but it won't open. They ask Leon why they can't go through, and he's like, uh, it's a brick wall. And when they look again, the door is gone. 
Then they ask how they leave Travers Town, and Aerith is like, use that door over there, and they look to see that there's a door where there wasn't one before. I don't know, there's a bunch of door shenanigans here. The post Travers Town cutscene plays out pretty much the same. Marluxia and Axel talk to SDG, and then Axel fights Sora. In this written version of the fight, Axel uses his firewall attack, and Donald puts out some fire with Blizzard and hits Axel in the face with some of it. Thankfully, he doesn't cast fire on Axel and heal him like he sometimes does in the game. During their post-fight chat, when Axel says to Sora that he's lost sight of the light within the darkness, Sora recalls that he heard something similar before, and his inner monologue calls back to what Kairi said to him in the secret waterway. After Axel leaves and the group ponders his cryptic message, the gang discusses which card they should use next, and Donald suggests just going in the same order they went last time, which is exactly what I would do. Apparently, according to theater mode, the canon order is Agrabah, then Olympus, then Wonderland, which is just insanity, if you ask me. The early portions of Wonderland play out pretty much exactly the same. During the fight with the card soldiers, Donald yells at Sora for getting them mixed up in the trial thanks to Sora rushing in and, quote, saying something screwy. After they flee from the Queen's court, the trio remarks that they have to find Alice, and Goofy adds that she did, after all, help them back at that castle. Sora asks what castle, and Goofy says, uh, you know, the princesses? And Donald's like, Alice isn't a princess, which echoes what a lot of us were saying in 2002. Goofy tries to explain that it was kinda different, that Jasmine and Belle were also there. They're able to remember and list all of their names, but they've forgotten about Hollow Bastion entirely, hearkening back to the scene in the hallway from before when Goofy couldn't remember its name. The novel starts sprinkling in this idea of it being hard to remember everything that's ever happened to you, like things that happened when you were really young. It's brought up after the Axel fight and during this conversation here with Alice. I'm guessing this is to build up a bit more runway to Sora's false memories of Naminé from when he was really little. Later on, when the trio is talking to the goddamn Cheshire Cat, when he mentions that your memories might lie to you, the narration discusses how Sora doesn't remember a ton about when he turned into a shadow. It notes that all he really knows is that Kairi saved him, but only because she was holding him when he got his body back. It then posits the question, what if it had been someone else? The encounter in the bazaar room plays out as usual, with the Trickmaster showing up and being defeated pretty quickly. The novel once again returns to the idea of Healer Goofy, as he's noted as supplying Sora and Donald potions during the fight. Before they leave, Alice thanks SDG for their help and then curtsies. Donald exclaims, just like a princess, and Alice is like, what? Oh, right, I stole Ariel's spot because I have legs, and then the trio leaves. The sequence in the hallway afterwards with the missing journal plays out pretty much exactly the same, and the party moves on to Agrabah. We then get the first scene of Larxene and Axel talking with a bit of an addition. Axel wonders why, quote, the king's minions are still with Sora if it's a world made entirely of his memories. Larxene muses that maybe they also have some power or strength of heart. Honestly, it's kind of a weird addition that doesn't really go anywhere. As the party enters Agrabah and helps Aladdin with the bandits, Sora thinks to himself about how Donald and Goofy remembered Aladdin and Genie's names, but Sora couldn't. This is definitely a contrast to how things are portrayed in the game, where it seems like none of them remember any of the Disney characters. Aladdin, though he doesn't remember any of them, is able to give Sora's name here without needing to be told what it is, and Goofy remembers the rules of the genie. Later on, when Aladdin brings up Jasmine, Donald and Goofy remember that she's a princess of heart, but Sora doesn't seem to remember what that means. On their way to the palace, the group fights off Heartless, and Donald comments to Genie, you know, you could help, and Genie's like, uh, I didn't hear anyone ask me to, and they shouldn't unless they're really bad with numbers. During the first encounter with Jafar here, Sora ponders to himself how he's forgotten so much of his first adventure and wonders if he's starting to remember new things as well. He also recalls how he envisioned a girl in a white dress before they arrived in Agrabah. During the fight with Genie Jafar, Sora tries to directly whack him with the Keyblade, which obviously doesn't work. The group recalls that they had to do something different to defeat him last time, eventually remembering they need to get their hands on the lamp. In a bit of a twist, Sora grabs the lamp and actually uses a wish to seal Jafar away. In addition, instead of just being transported to the boss room from KH1, the ground beneath the palace actually splits and the party jumps in to chase after Jafar and they find themselves in the big lava block room. Instead of returning to the palace gates afterwards, the ending cutscene takes place in this room. In the Naminé interlude between the chapters here, it seems like she's crafting the false memories of her and Sora on the island, of them drawing in the secret place and fighting with Riku. In the scene where Sora first discusses Naminé out loud, Goofy tries and fails to remember the name of Sora's island, reminiscent of his attempts to remember the name of Hollow Bastion. This time, he recalls Destiny Islands as Dusty Islands. The scene as it appears in the novel is actually combined with the scene that takes place after Monstro in the game. In the game, Goofy assures Sora that he'll remember more about the girl eventually, and the scene ends. In the novel, the conversation continues to have Sora talk about his memories of her from the island, featuring dialogue from young Riku and Sora arguing about who she'd draw. 
The scene ends faithfully to the post-Monstro scene from the game, with Donald and Goofy naively excited to awaken their own hidden memories. I'm assuming these conversations were combined to account for the cut worlds that would normally give the trio more opportunities to talk before and after each floor. Very minor observation, but in the Lark scene and Axel scene that follows, Axel doesn't violently throw the card at Lark scene, which is maybe for the best, those things are workplace hazards. Speaking of moving things around though, Larxene actually shows up to confront Sora immediately after that scene instead of waiting for a floor. Their first meeting plays out pretty much exactly the same, with a fight that lasts a little less than half a page. I will say, I think the change to have all of this happen between the Agraba and Monstro floors does damage the pacing of the story a bit. There's much less of a gradual build-up to Sora remembering Namine's name, he and by extension the audience has much less time to think about it, and this quicker reveal diminishes the mystery element that I think Chain of Memories is so good at utilizing. But again, I get why they did it, there's less Disney stuff on hand to put in between these scenes. Vexen's introductory scene plays out nearly identically, with the only addition being a line of dialogue directed at a boy with silver hair, that being the Riku replica who we see step in from off-screen in the game. After that, the gang finally winds up in Monstro, so bear in mind all of the stuff that we get from Sora's nominee story onwards normally happens after both Monstro and Halloween Town in the game. When Sora meets with Geppetto and he explains how he and Pinocchio are trapped inside Monstro, Sora relates their experience to how Namine might be feeling. As small as these asides are, I do think they add a lot and would have been welcome additions to the game. The Disney worlds and comms certainly have themes that tie back to the overarching story in Castle Oblivion, but a handful of more explicit references to the grander plot, even if they're made in passing, and at the risk of the audience feeling beat over the head with it, could have helped to make these Disney worlds feel less insulated. By the point where SDG are exploring Monstro to re-find Pinocchio, Donald now knows Tier 2 magic as he's seen casting Fyra on some Heartless, and he'll use Blizzara a few pages later. He is yet to use anything besides fire or blizzard magic, for the record. New to the novel, Goofy struggles to remember if there was another person with Pinocchio the last time the trio was in Monstro, eventually remembering that it was Riku who kidnapped Pinocchio. Donald and Sora have no memory of this, so Goofy is just strangely better at remembering in some instances, despite not knowing the names of Hollow Bastion or Destiny Islands. A minor thing I noticed, but when fighting the Parasite Cage, the novel notes it as having a metallic body, which I find weird. It seems kind of fleshy and squishy to me, but I'm no heartless biologist. The novel slightly changes how the party escapes from Monstro. Instead of fighting a bunch of heartless like in the game, the trio decides to just hit the walls and floor as hard as they can until Monstro ejects them. Instead of ending up in the mouth area like in the game, the party wakes up on what the novel describes as a rocky shore, which reminds me of the areas in Prankster's Paradise. The three make it back to Castle Oblivion when Donald notices a door set in a random boulder. So since the novel has dealt with all the Lark scene stuff early, after leaving Monstro, the party comes face to face with the Riku replica for the first time, which normally happens at the exit of the seventh floor. I have a small, nerdy nitpick to make in this scene. The narration comments that Sora felt relieved to see Riku in his normal clothes, and quote, not like when Ansem had possessed him, turning his outfit all strange and inky dark. Um, actually, Riku had his heartless pajamas well before Ansem possessed him. He got them from Maleficent and is wearing them in the first Hollow Bastion fight. As the novel briefly describes a fight scene, it throws in a line that made me chuckle. The replica says, I never liked you, you know. Like, fuck, that's brutal, Repliku. You got him. Donald and Goofy also try to help Sora, but he tells them to stay back so Sora can fight him on his own. Afterwards, the party arrives in Neverland, with none of them having any recollection of being there, beyond Goofy calling Tinkerbell by name without having been told it. When the party first meets with Peter Pan, the narration gives Donald's thoughts on him, quote, He just didn't like this kid. The novel adds in a scene that's reminiscent of a cutscene in Cage 1, but unlike anything in Chain of Memories, where Peter tells the gang that anyone can fly, followed by Donald trying and failing to do so. Afterwards, they find Wendy in one of the cabins. Unlike in the game, when Peter calls the trio his new lost boys, they all audibly complain, which he ignores. In between first meeting Wendy and fighting Captain Hook, the novel gives us another scene of the trio fighting Heartless and bemoaning how they're unable to fly like Peter. Goofy says he recalls being able to fly before, but only in a dream. And then Donald's like, well, no shit, if we're talking dreams, then I can fly too. That's a direct quote. Donald says he remembers flying around a great big clock tower, referring to Big Ben in KH1, and Goofy claims to have had the same dream as well. During the Hook fight, Donald finally uses Thundara for the first time, which hits Hook's sword. It only seems to mildly annoy Hook, which is consistent with how Thunder Magic is absorbed by him in KH1. In the novel's version of the fight, Peter taunts Hook by flying above him while holding Wendy, and Sora baits him by egging him on while standing near the edge of the ship. Hook charges at him, calls him a rotten mongrel, and then falls off the deck. When the party encounters the Riku replica for the second time, and he brings up how he told Sora to take care of Kairi, Sora's inner monologue goes into a frenzy, trying to piece together what he thinks he remembers. 
he feels guilty for not listening to Riku and instead going on a quest to find him and Mickey, but justifies it by reasoning that all three of them have to be together. But then he remembers that Namine would make four, though he only remembers three of them running up the beach together. He tries to reason out when Namine arrived, if it was before Kairi showed up, but his thoughts are interrupted by Repliku. Once again, Sora orders Donald and Goofy to stay back as he solos Repliku, even though they had a prior conversation about letting his friends be there for him, but whatever. Their fight is brief, but includes Sora asking the Replica if he remembers fighting like this on the beach, to which he replies, I remember you losing. Sick comeback, to be honest. After Repliku throws his tantrum and runs away, the page ends with a to be continued, signifying the end of part one of Sora's story. The next page, but prior to part two, we see Axel's dialogue directed toward Namine in the usual interlude italics, though it doesn't discern who's saying it. But the next part kicks off with the same dialogue, this time making it clear that Axel is talking to Namine, so I assume its first inclusion was just meant to serve as a teaser for part two. Although memories of their first adventure have varied from completely forgotten to partially remembered, upon entering Hollow Bastion, Donald demonstrates that he's familiar with the castle. When the party sees Beast from a distance, Goofy wonders if he's a Heartless, and Sora responds, I don't think so, he has a face and everything, as if most Heartless they've seen do not have faces. After eavesdropping on Belle and Beast, Sora decides he ought to help them, claiming those two are probably our friends, I bet, and Goofy surmises that although he doesn't remember them at all, the worlds in the castle are made up of Sora's memories, and it's likely that the Beast helps Sora out at some point, and Sora concurs. Right after this, the party fights some Heartless and Donald casts Blazaga, the first time we see him use a Tier 3 spell. The trio immediately recognizes that they've grown stronger, and they hope that since they've managed to reclaim their strength, they can also reclaim their memories, as well as Riku's. When the party talks to Belle and she realizes Maleficent is coming, she tells them to hide. In the game, they just run off screen. In the novel, Sora hides under a desk, Goofy jumps behind some curtains, and Donald panics and runs around in circles. Eventually, he manages to squeeze between some bookcases before Maleficent shows up. In the game, or at least the recom version, the scene where Maleficent steals Belle's heart takes place in the entrance hall, whereas in the novel, it happens in the castle chapel. Another small difference, in the game, when Belle jumps in the way of Maleficent's attack, her body vanishes and leaves a heart behind, whereas in the novel she's noted as collapsing into Beast's arms. But when they defeat Maleficent, her heart is released and takes shape as Belle again, but her body never disappeared in the novel in the first place, so is there both an unconscious Belle corpse and a living Belle? I'm being pedantic, but if you're reading this without prior knowledge of the game, it would probably seem weird that the heart just turned back into Belle when there was never any reason to believe her body was gone. After Hollow Bastion, during the scene where Axel and Larxene taunt Vexen, Larxene's insults from both versions of the game are replaced with calling Vexen simple-minded for a scientist. In the following scene where Sora falsely recalls the promise he made to Namine, he conflates it with the last words he spoke to Kairi at the end of Cage 1, as the narration references someone saying, I know you will, and their joined hands pulling apart, the world's crumbling, the rain of light falling. Okay, so I was curious to see how they'd handle this. If you watch my video where I compared the KH1 novel to the game, you might recall how Sora never visits the 100 Acre Wood. He sees and even delivers the book to Merlin, like in the game, but just mentions that he'll be back to check it out later, and then never returns. So once I saw that there was a chapter titled 100 Acre Wood in the Chain of Memories novel, I wondered what route they'd take. Fittingly, when the gang sees the card with the book on it, none of them have any memory of visiting a place like that, though they also didn't remember Hollow Bastion either. Upon entering, Sora notices that Donald, Goofy, and Jiminy aren't alongside him like in previous worlds. Unlike in the game, where Sora and Pooh meet up with Piglet immediately after their first talk, the two have another conversation in between where they talk about their friends. Pooh asks who Sora's friends are and what they're like, and Sora lists off Donald, Goofy, Jiminy, Riku, and Namine. Pooh's like, oh, so not as many friends as I have, and Sora's like, well, I, I know that I have more than that, I just don't really remember all of them. Not exactly a ringing endorsement, kind of gives the same energy as like, oh, my girlfriend goes to a different school, you, you wouldn't know her. On the same page, I especially enjoyed this true-to-game description, the carefree little bear walked very slowly and Sora had to wait for him, which meant they weren't getting very far. There's also this part where Sora tries to put Pooh in a wheelbarrow so he can push him in it and speed up the process, but it breaks so they just go back to walking. I thought this was entirely invented for the novel, but there is a small optional part in the GBA version where you can jump into a wheelbarrow and cause its wheel to pop off. In the novel, Piglet gives Pooh a blue balloon, whereas in the game he gives you a confused slight, which is pretty much the same thing. The novel sometimes likes to make the parallels between what happens in the Disney worlds and the overarching story much more obvious by having Sora outright point them out in his inner monologue. 
You could argue this is a bad thing since you might say it's spoon feeding it to you, but it can also be pretty good for those who might write off these Disney floors immediately when they often have at least a little subtext to them. I bring this up now because Owl has a line about Pooh using the balloon to search for his friends and possibly finding them but being unable to reach them, and the narration likens that to Sora finding but not reaching Riku. After talking with Eeyore, Sora and Pooh meet Tigger, who's also joined by Rue here instead of being by himself. I just mentioned how the novel will try to make those parallels crystal clear, though sometimes it can feel like a reach. Tigger says, Bouncing is best when you do it your way, cause I'm Tigger and you're Sora. And Sora goes completely doomer, though the novel does at least acknowledge how his thoughts keep turning gloomy despite being in such a bright, peaceful place. He thinks to himself, I'm me, and you're you. We both want the same thing, but we're doing it differently. So why do we have to fight? How do I get Riku to go back to the Riku I know? And it's like, relax bro, it ain't that deep, we're talking about overexcited tigers here. After that, Pooh gets demolished by a giant cabbage. Rabbit bemoans how he intended to use his wheelbarrow to move his vegetables, but some asshole came along and broke it. Pooh nearly rats Sora out, but Sora covers his mouth and is like, hey, shouldn't we be going? We have like, so much stuff to do. In his inner monologue, Sora ponders if his accidental destruction of Rabbit's wheelbarrow is comparable to causing something awful to happen without thinking anything of it with regards to Riku. With that, Sora and Pooh part ways and the former finds the door back to the castle amidst some bushes. So, in the end, it's weird that Sora even comes here. Since all of these worlds are made up from his memories, the 100 Acre Wood shouldn't really be here, at least as far as the novel's own canon is concerned. I guess we can just assume Sora actually did visit the book back in the Cage 1 novel off-screen, or off-page, rather. The nomine interlude afterwards opens as follows. The first time we met was in that town, and ever since we met, I've been here. Someone who seems the same, who smells the same, and I was just happy to see the chain of memories fixation on smell was maintained for the novel. Upon re-entering the castle proper, Sora reunites with DGJ, who have no idea where Sora or themselves were, having just come to in the hallway. Before they can further discuss this convenient displacement, they're interrupted by Vexen, who's here to collect Sora's debt. For whatever reason, Donald steals Goofy's line where he asks if Sora owes him something. Vexen soon after attacks Sora and a fight ensues, featuring a moment where Vexen freezes Sora's feet to the floor and Donald uses Fyra to melt him free while also catching Sora's pants on fire. This is also one of the longest fight sequences so far, most battles are depicted in a few sentences, but this one has a bit more back and forth. Goofy runs around trying to evade Vexen's ice stalagmites and Sora attempts to attack Vexen but notes that his shield protects him from any frontal attacks, as it does in the game. The trio comes up with a plan that has Sora using a strike raid type of attack that Donald imbues with a fire spell while Goofy blocks Vexen's ice shards with his shield. The attack manages to wound Vexen enough to end the battle. Donald once again steals Sora's line where he says, as if we'd ever lose to you. During the first scene in Twilight Town, Sora describes the fake promise he made to Namine about knocking the shooting stars back into space. His inner monologue conflates that made-up meteor shower with his conversation with Riku about how Kairi arrived on the night of a meteor shower, now thinking that that was when Namine arrived on the islands. As they make their way through Twilight Town, the trio comments on how the Heartless here are weak and sluggish and don't even really try to attack unless they get close to them. I'm not sure if their relative weakness is just a reference to how most of the Twilight Town Heartless in the game are the typically early game shadows and soldiers, or if this is alluding to something else. Goofy also feels like he remembers coming across Heartless that didn't attack before, though it doesn't ring a bell for Donald or Sora. There was never any reference to white mushrooms or rare truffles in the Cage 1 novel, so I can only assume he's referring to Sora's brief stint as a pacifist Heartless in Hollow Bastion. A very minor but amusing detail, but when SDG encounter Vexen outside the old mansion, the novel describes him as a tall, sickly man. I never really perceived Vexen as particularly sickly, but I also don't think it's the most incorrect adjective to use. A second fight with Vexen soon breaks out. Sora attempts to use the same move as last time, but Vexen blocks it and this time freezes Goofy to the ground. Throughout the battle, Donald uses all three tiers of fire, go figure. Goofy once again acts as Team Healer and gives Sora a potion in the middle of the battle. Eventually, Sora jumps over some ice chunks to land behind Vexen and hit him, ending the fight as he falls on one knee. Oddly enough, Vexen's death scene is edited to, I guess, be less gruesome. I know this was written between GBA-com and Recom, and most people consider the latter version of the scene to be brutal, but I'd say the original depiction of it is still pretty violent. Axel's initial attack, which is a thrown chakram from behind in GBA-com and from the front in Recom, is changed and described instead as follows. A dazzling light blinded them. He heard Vexen grunt, and then in the next moment he saw him sprawled on the ground. When Axel finishes the job, instead of a chakram slash like in the original, or lighting Vexen on fire like in the remake, the novel just says Axel shot a bright light from his hand again. 
Axel's quip about Vexen being nothing instead of just being a nobody is also altered a bit, saying, we're nobodies, we have no one to be, we just are, but now you don't have to be at all. No more existence, no more memories. If anything, I guess I sort of expected the novel to keep Vexen's death just as gruesome considering they don't have to visually depict it here, but it felt considerably toned down. Probably the most interesting new thing so far, we actually get something of a scene from Axel's perspective, where he's noted as walking through the castle corridors, which he normally doesn't do considering he can just use portals, but he's described as needing some time to himself. He has a bit of an extended internal monologue, which I'll read here. I don't have a single friend in this place. All these people on my side, and his, and the organizations. But I don't know if I can say that we're really on the same side. I'm alone here. He's nobody. No one at all. And yet, he is somebody. Shards of emotion. Fragments of memory. So alike, but they're completely different things. Even if we can hold on to a few fragments of memory, we can't have the smallest shred of emotion, nostalgia, and memory. We are the ones who lost their hearts. The ones who are no one. Nobodies. Not light, not darkness. We live in the twilight. Why are we here? What are we doing? No. Why am I here? The scene between him, Larxene, Marluxia, and Naminé then plays out like usual. After that, SDG encounter Repliku, and once again, Sora commands Donald and Goofy to step aside as he fights him one-on-one. -on -one. This time, he is kind of rude about it and tells them to stay out of the way, which Goofy points out. In the scene afterwards where Axel lets Naminé run free, I was shocked to see that they kept Axel saying hell. I was really getting the impression they were going to phrase it differently, but no, he pretty much keeps the GBA line. There's a funny addition after his last line, which reads, There was no one to hear his speech. He's just talking to us, I guess. Most of the Destiny Islands floor plays out the same, word for word, culminating in the battle against Darkseid. The novel notes that Sora, quote, felt like by now he must have fought this thing a hundred times. It's the fourth time, but I appreciate the exaggeration. Once again, like in the KH1 novel, but unlike in any of the games, Darkseid is noted as screaming as it's killed, which, once again, again, is a terrifying thought to me. During the double Naminé scene, when Naminé eventually morphs into a vision of Kairi, her words from the text bubble scene in Cage one about her good luck charm echo through Sora's mind. After this, in the game, Sora leaves Destiny Islands. In the novel, there's an additional scene of Sora entering the secret place where he notices doodles on the cave walls, including one of a girl handing a paupu fruit to Sora, who he recognizes as the red-haired girl from his vision. Sora adds to the drawing like he does in KH1 as he hears echoes of Kairi's voice from the KH1 ending. In the same moment, the door inside the secret place glowed and opened, leading Sora back to Castle Oblivion. The subsequent final fight with the Riku replica plays out pretty much the same with some additional but mostly superfluous dialogue. The chapter ends with Naminé breaking the replica's mind. Quote, Sora rushed up to help him, but Riku's eyes were open and unseeing. He wasn't there. Riku! Sora's cries echoed on the cold, marble walls. This sentence, with half a blank page beneath it, accompanied by the mostly pitch black next page, is an oddly ominous moment for the novel. The scene obviously continues in the game, but cutting it off here could almost convince you that Naminé just killed Riku if you didn't know any better. The next chapter, unlike the previous ones which were named after the world Sora was visiting on that floor, is titled The Chaotic World, which I don't think is really a reference to anything in Chain of Memories itself, though it does remind me of the World of Chaos from KH1. The chapter is entirely set in Castle Oblivion, beginning with the Larxene fight and ending with the Axel one, so it's kind of odd and unlike the other chapters, which are cleanly comprised of each world and whatever Castle Oblivion stuff happens immediately before and after it. At the start of this chapter, Larxene shows up and taunts Sora, and he actually tries to attack her before she can, so that's a bit of a change. Sora swung first. This happens in the middle of her explanation about the Riku replica, so she just sidesteps him and continues her lines. Before the true fight begins, we actually get some italic text from Larxene's perspective, sort of similar to what we got from Axel after he murdered Vexen. It's a bit odd here, since it's the first time we get inside Larxene's head, and it happens right in the middle of a scene. Following her line about Axel screwing everything up for her and Marluxia's plan, she thinks, Everyone's just been getting in the way. The Keyblade Master, Axel, Naminé, they're all just getting in our way. Why do they want to screw up all of our plans? All we want is... dot dot dot, as she readies her knives and is blocked by Naminé. Like in the game, Donald and Goofy show up to bail Sora out when Larxene attacks, although Donald... <sighs> doesn't cast Cure on him like in the game. The novel is obsessed with portraying Donald as the degenerate healer that many players sadly perceive him as. The Larxene fight lasts for like two whole pages, with a lot of knife throwing and teleporting going on. One of the knives is actually noted as slicing Sora's cheek, which in terms of violence was one more cheek slice than I was anticipating. Eventually, the trio takes her down with the Blazaga slash shield slash keyblade combo attack. Larxene says this can't be happening, and Donald says it sure is, which I just found very funny. During the following conversation with Naminé, she tells the party that they can reclaim their lost memories by going to the 13th floor. 
If you've been paying attention, you'll know that they're currently on the 10th floor and not the 12th like in the game, thanks to the cut worlds, so Goofy says then we only have to go up three more stories, so I was curious to see how this would be handled. It probably would have been easiest to ditch the 13 floors idea and just make the next floor the top of the castle, but for those of you unfamiliar with the novel, I want you to pause the video and give yourself a few seconds to guess which world Sora, Donald, and Goofy wind up in after their conversation with Namine. Actually, make a quick list of your top five guesses. Seriously, let's do this as an exercise together. Alright, you back? I'm betting some of you went for worlds that aren't in Chain of Memories but could reasonably show up. Maybe the world it never was. If Twilight Town is here, you could reason it as possible. Or maybe a dive to the heart, since it was, in fact, early but cut content for Chain of Memories. Nope, neither of those. Oh, maybe it's some of those KH1 worlds that weren't depicted in either of the novels, but we're gonna sort of speed through them really quick now. Olympus, Halloween Town, maybe? Not quite. Did any of you have fucking Monstro on your shortlist? Because that's where we're at. The picture on the card the party looks at is described only as a white mist. The novel added in floors of what I can only describe as amalgamations of the previous worlds, which is kicked off by them showing up in a brightly colored, squishy, and unsteady room. And then, after killing a few Heartless, they run through a door and wind up in Destiny Islands. Even the ordering is so bizarre. If anything, you would think the whole thing would kick off in Traverse Town or Wonderland, but it just sort of starts in the middle and jumps around. I guess this is the reasoning for calling the chapter the Chaotic World. Donald and Goofy comment on how they'd never been to this world before and express excitement for finally getting to see Sora's home. Sora takes the good luck charm out of his pocket and notices that it's no longer the Paupu fruit looking pendant, but instead something made from seashells. Sora tries to remember the person most special to him and sees Kairi's face, but can't remember her name. Goofy and Donald try to recall memories of their own, but are only able to remember that they're looking for a friend who's important to them, but can't remember any names. At this point, I realize that we're reading the scene that plays out at the beginning of the Castle Oblivion floor in the game, only now it's set on Destiny Islands for some reason. After that, we get the scene of Marluxia showing up where Namine and the broken Riku replica are, which plays out wordlessly in both games. It also happens in the early portions of the Castle Oblivion floor, before the Axel fight. Here, Marluxia and Namine exchange some brief words, and we see Marley grab her arm and tell her not to worry about the useless puppet laying on the floor. SDG continue on through the mishmash floor, arriving on the deck of a ship and a forest of big green lily pads. Marluxia is then described as walking up through the stories, dragging Namine alongside him, stopping at a big room that serves as the entrance hall to floor number 12 when he's intercepted by Axel. After Axel lays out Marluxia's plan, the narration refers to the organization as Organization 13, which is never done in either version of the game. By this point, SDG have caught up, so I assume only floor 11 was the big glob of repeat worlds, and they're now in between floors 11 and 12. Axel then attacks the trio for a bit of an extended fight sequence featuring a lot of Blazagas, the flame wall attack, and Goofy using his spinning technique. During the fight, Axel taunts Sora a bit, most notably commenting, It's funny, you really have nothing on him. I assume this is supposed to refer to Roxas, though I would think that even a Sora with broken memories is a bigger threat than Roxas at a handful of weeks old, whom Axel doesn't even really know that well by this point, but not sure who else he'd be referring to. They eventually defeat Axel by using the same technique they used to beat Vexen, this time with Donald imbuing Sora's Keyblade with the Blazaga spell to hit Axel while Goofy crashes into him with his shield. After he vanishes, he leaves behind a single card, which obviously doesn't happen in the game since they're already on floor 13. This time, the card does in fact depict the castle itself. But before the trio can face Marluxia, we're actually interrupted by what the novel describes as a short chapter titled Fragments. This takes us to the basement of Castle Oblivion to show us a scene from Riku's story, where Axel speaks with Zexion. Like in the game, they speculate over who's going to be the next member to fall, and the novel gives us a bit of flavoring here. It notes that despite Axel having been on good terms with Marluxia, Axel viewed him as a lower-ranking opponent for Sora. It also notes that the member's assigned numbers in the organization does not directly correspond to strength, and Vexen's fate was proof enough of that. It also sort of spoils that Riku takes down Lexius during his story, which is kind of weird, I feel like it could have been edited to protect against that. When the scene ends, so does the chapter. Finally, SDG have reached the proper Castle Oblivion floor, and Sora comments on how the Heartless here look different than the ones they've fought before. The narration expands on this, comparing them to shadows, but shaped differently and with different movement patterns, referring to Neo Shadows. This is the first time the Calm novel has made an attempt to describe any kind of generic Heartless, which the Cage one novel did on a handful of occasions. After the party defeats the Neo Shadows, the scene briefly changes to Riku in Destiny Islands, which I definitely wasn't expecting. We get a little bit of an inner monologue from Riku, where he wonders how long he'll have to walk this path by himself and about where Sora might be. He remembers Mickey saying to him that he's not alone, though he's not alongside him in this moment. With that, the scene ends and switches back to SDG. 
Before they catch up to Marluxia, the gang has an additional conversation where they remind each other of the promise they made, that they're friends regardless of if they're split up or end up forgetting one another. Eventually, they make it to Marluxia and Namine. I just have to point out this one line, Sora demands that Marluxia let Namine go. Donald chimes in, yeah, you better, and Goofy adds, you shouldn't be mean to girls. That is such a great point, Goof. Eventually, they launch into a fight sequence that includes SDG and the Riku replica fighting alongside each other, which was kinda cool. They eventually defeat the illusion Marluxia and realize the real version is behind a large set of doors in the back of the room. As Sora holds up a final card, one depicting a bunch of flower petals, the scene shifts very briefly to Mickey running through the realm of darkness, talking to himself about needing to catch up with Riku as quickly as possible. SDG enter the final boss arena, which the novel describes as a world of gloom, not darkness, but not light either, only a strange, drifting space. Marluxia reveals himself, piloting what the narration calls an enormous sort of winged mecha with two cruel scythes, which Donald deems unfair. Interestingly, the novel soon after names the mech as the Spectre, which is its official name but never given in the game. The battle begins with much of the same fare as usual, Sora slashing and dodging attacks, Donald unleashing all three of his tier 3 magic spells, and Goofy, for whatever reason, serving as the potion guy. Eventually, they manage to break off one of the scythes. Throughout the battle, Marluxia makes comments to himself and the trio, stating that they'll never understand the agony that the organization feels, and expresses his desire to wield the power of the Keyblade. Soon after, the three defeat Marluxia and the Spectre through what seems to be Trinity Limit, as Sora is described as digging the Keyblade into the mecha's surface, followed by Donald and Goofy landing beside him as a glow surrounds the trio. No third form in the novel, Marluxia is down for the count, and STG escape back into the castle proper. In the following scene where SDG talk with Namine and the Riku replica, the latter leaves despite Sora's pleas, and the scene briefly shifts to the replica bumping into Axel, who asks him if he'd like to become the real thing, before shifting back to SDG. And the final cutscene takes place in the epilogue chapter, where Namine takes SDG up to the pod room located on the 13th floor, which if you lost track means all the Axel and Marluxia stuff happens on the 12th floor in the novel. And with that, the ending plays out as usual as Namine shoves Sora into the egg pod and he falls asleep. But wait, there's more. The novel, of course, also covers Riku's campaign, Reverse Rebirth, which in this collection begins immediately after the Sora epilogue chapter. As is the case with their campaigns in the game, Riku's story in the novel is shorter. It's about 137 pages to Sora's 259. The chapters in Riku's story all have the naming structure of being one word that starts with the letter R instead of being named after the worlds he visits. The first one is titled Recollect, which begins after the prologue scene of Riku waking up in the void and choosing to abandon his boring nap. At the door to Hollow Bastion, Riku recalls the disembodied voice warning him, the truth will bring you pain, and he thinks to himself, even if it is painful, it'll only be punishment for what I did, which is some early and explicitly expressed remorse that we see from Riku here in the novel. We get some interesting inner monologuing from Riku on the next page, where he reminisces on his time spent in Hollow Bastion, including these lines. I stayed by Kairi's side where she slept. Kairi never moved or spoke, just like a doll. But I stayed with her, and I felt happy, just a little bit, because I had her all to myself. This rang weird as fuck to me, because while Sora and Riku definitely butted heads over Kairi's attention in KH1, Riku never read as so outwardly possessive to me in the game. To me it always felt less about having Kairi all to himself, and more about him proving his strength and competence, being the one to protect and save her. But that could just be me. Soon after, Riku is ambushed by Heartless, and he's surprised to see that he manifests the Soul Eater, since he thought he had turned away from darkness. The narration notes that this is the first time he'd actually fought against the Heartless, and that they used to fight on his side, almost as if they were friends. After leaving his former room, Riku climbs up to the highest tower in the castle, which is noted as his secret place where no one came to bother him, not even Maleficent. While here, he reflects on how he abandoned Sora and Kairi when he left the island, though they didn't abandon him. After a bit of brooding, he heads back down into the castle. In Riku's meeting with Maleficent, most of their conversation actually takes place while they fight, with Maleficent in her base form, unlike in the game. She does turn into the dragon at the end of the conversation. Not long after she transforms, Riku actually hears Mickey's voice telling him to fight. Riku manages to use piles of stones that fall from the ceiling to reach the dragon and attack her, and seems to pretty much defeat her with one slash to the throat. Unlike in the game, Maleficent resumes her witch form after being defeated, and then taunts Riku, telling him he'll never be able to escape the darkness. And with that, Riku, quote, brought Soul Eater down on her and Maleficent's body turned to glowing light and disappeared. He just straight up executes her. After Riku leaves Hollow Bastion, we get the first scene with Zexion, Lexius, and Vexen, which in the game actually happens after Riku's next conversation and short battle with Ansem. 
The novel describes Vexen having long, dull blonde hair that frames a horribly sallow face. It's just ruthless with these Vexen descriptions. We then get the confrontation between Riku and Ansem, complete with Mickey's interjection and Riku and Ansem's brief battle, which concludes with Ansem tossing Riku four cards and tempering the darkness in his heart. Riku still thankfully recognizes the smelliness that is darkness. So here's where I got really curious about how the novel would handle Riku's story. In the game, all of these Disney worlds are composed of random rooms and then one boss fight and that's it. No story content whatsoever, so I was interested to see how they'd fill all these pages. The second chapter, named Recall, is oddly set in Monstro, I would have expected Traverse Town or Agrippa first. But immediately it's made clear that the novel will be inventing a lot of stuff for these chapters as Riku runs into Pinocchio, who Riku remembers but not the other way around. Riku asks if Pinocchio is all alone, he says no, his nose grows, and then he admits he's here with his father. Pinocchio asks Riku if he has a father, and Riku says he doesn't have anyone. So, Riku's dad deconfirmed, I guess. Pinocchio says, oh, so you're all alone, and his nose grows again, and this is a fascinating development in the Pinocchio metagame. You can literally just get him to repeat something that you're insecure or unsure about, and the universe will confirm or deny it by whether or not Pinocchio's nose grows. Upon seeing this, Riku remembers Mickey telling him that he's not alone, and then Pinocchio just sort of leaves. Soon after, Riku, quote, kicks at a weird, flabby lump on the wall, which spits out a bunch of Heartless. As he fights them, Riku thinks about how maybe he and his friends could have made it off the island on the raft if not for the Heartless and the people trying to use them. And, like, definitely not, right? They would have sailed in a loop or died, I think. But here we get a fully-fledged flashback to the Night of the Storm on Destiny Islands. Riku recalls running through the rain to check on the raft when he noticed a big door in front of the secret place. He's then greeted by a man in a black coat, which is Ansem, though um actually it's supposed to be a brown robe, but whatever. Kairi runs up to him soon after, and Riku hears the robed man say, Sess Art. Not knowing what he was saying at the time thanks to the noise of the storm, he knows now that he was saying Princess of Heart. Kairi worries about the raft washing away, but Riku tells her to forget about the raft because there's another way to go to the outside world. Kairi asks, what about Sora? And Riku thinks to himself, right, because Kairi would only think of Sora. Like, oh my god, what a little shit! Riku turns to Ansem and asks if Sora and Kairi could come too. He nods and vanishes. Riku tells Kairi to wait by the door as he goes to find Sora, and then we get a retelling of the scene where they meet up on the small island in Cage 1. Riku recalls being covered in darkness and then everything going dark until he eventually woke up in Hollow Bastion. So far, I'd have to say this is the most interesting thing the novel has given me, since it filled in some stuff that we don't normally get insight on, even if it's nothing mind-blowing. It also doesn't really break the story or cheapen anything as we know it from the games. Meanwhile, the novel gives us the scene of SDG first arriving in the castle with a few bits of their conversation, I guess to establish the timeline and to show that Sora is looking for Riku despite how alone he feels in these moments. The novel then shows us the scene where Zexion and Vexen talk about Riku and Sora both being in the castle, and this plays out without any notable changes besides the fact that this is happening in the middle of a floor instead of at the end of one. The perspective then returns to Riku, who continues to fight Heartless and wonders where they go when they disappear, if they go back to the Realm of Darkness, and if he'll go to the same place if he disappears. To me, this sort of rang as foreshadowing for the final moment with the Riku replica later on. Shortly after, the parasite cage drops from above, and Riku says, Perfect, I'm in the mood to hit something. Novel Riku is such a weird little guy. As he begins to attack the cage, he notices that a black mist has surrounded him and that he's now wearing his dark outfit from Cage 1, so I guess this is showing us that dark mode is canon to the novel. Riku notices that even when the cage attacks him, he hardly even flinches, as if he absorbs the attack, so it seems that the darkness literally makes him defensively stronger in this case. He defeats the cage with ease and his outfit returns to normal. After Riku leaves Monstro, he encounters Vexen, which normally wouldn't happen until after Riku visits one more world, but again, since worlds have been cut, things are being moved around. They fight, and Vexen goads Riku into using the power of darkness, which Riku resists against, though he ends up donning his dark pajamas anyway. Riku is able to knock Vexen's shield from his hand, and the fight ends, with Vexen satisfied with the data he managed to collect. After that, we briefly switch over to SDG in the moment where Sora initially remembers Naminé being with him, Riku, and Kairi on Destiny Islands. The chapter then ends and we move on to the next one, titled Riku. Things kick off with Zexion and Lexius talking in their chamber, which again would normally take place at the end of the next world. The novel again comments on how although their numbers in the organization do not directly correspond to strength, Vexen had always been a senior member to both Lexius and Zexion, dating back to their time as humans, and the novel name drops Evan, Alias, and Ienzo here, which was sorta neat to see. 
Riku then enters the next world, which ends up being Neverland, or Captain Hook's pirate ship, more accurately. He stands on the deck and reminisces about the last time he was here with Sora and a comatose Kairi, regretting how he had tried to use the Heartless to destroy Sora. Soon after, Riku's shadow rises up from underneath his feet and attacks him, and Light creepily laughs at him all the while. As Riku fights back, he once again is enveloped in his dark outfit and the shadow laughs and disappears. Very briefly, we switch scenes to Vexen looking into a crystal ball and commenting on how Riku fears the darkness. He then sends the replica to find Riku and defeat him. Back in Neverland, Riku runs into Hook. He tells Riku that if he greets all of his friends with a sword, it's no wonder he keeps ending up alone. Riku argues that he and Hook were never friends, but Hook says that they share a bond of darkness. I have to say, Hook feels really badly written here, it just doesn't come off as believably him at all, like his vocabulary is just off. Anyway, he just generally taunts Riku about how he belongs to the darkness until Riku manages to land a hit on him, causing him to vanish on the spot. After leaving Neverland, Riku encounters his replica for the first time and very quickly defeats him without much trouble. We actually get the occasional italic line from the replica's perspective where he questions to himself if he doesn't know how to use his powers yet. When he runs off, we stick with him for a bit. He thinks to himself, Riku was strong, much stronger than me, but I'm him and he's me. I was so sure that if I could use the darkness better, I'd be stronger than the original. That was what Vexen told me too. The narration then comments, The replica kept running. It was the first time he ever had. It felt good. Everything did. This flows into the next scene of the replica talking with Vexen in the basement chamber. The scene is a bit extended here in the novel, where after the replica affirms that Sora will be no match for him, Vexen tells him they'll be heading above ground to meet some of the organization's underlings who want to witness his power for themselves. After Riku's meeting with Ansem again, in which he tosses him more cards even though he's only used two of the four he got the last time they met, we see that scene of Vexen, Axel, and Larxene from Sora's campaign that plays a second time in Riku's story in the game. When the replica is referred to as a valet or toy, we get some italic text moments where the replica reacts to these comments, though he remains steadfast and thinks to himself, I don't really care what anyone says. All I have to do is become stronger than the real one and defeat them. So it's kind of interesting to think that the replica is planning on taking out the organization in this moment. But just like in the game, Vexen betrays him and we end the chapter with the replica screaming as he begins to get his mind rewritten. Now here's where things get really interesting. The next chapter, titled Replica, is fittingly from the replica's perspective entirely. The chapter begins with the replica opening his eyes to reveal Destiny Islands, where he sees Sora, Kairi, Naminé, and Riku sitting on the shore. He watches Sora angrily running off, who yells that they always end up doing what Riku says, and Kairi runs after him. Riku is left with Naminé, and he asks her if she'll go run after him too. Naminé says if she did, Riku would be left all alone, but he says he doesn't mind being alone. Naminé says, Sora has Kairi, and you've got me, and then asks if she can draw him. When the replica tries to speak, the world, quote, spun into nothing. We then see that the replica is sleeping inside a huge pod. He opens his eyes and sees Vexen standing in front of him. Some italic text then reads, Conversion, 13% complete. We delve back into Destiny Islands where Repliku watches SRK running on the beach and realizes that the silver-haired boy is him. As he contemplates this, he then, quote, saw nothing but grey and he fell again into nothingness. The scene then changes to a young version of Riku standing in front of the secret place alongside Sora as they listen for noises from inside the cave. This ends up being a retelling of the scene that plays when you first enter Monstro in KH1, this time with the replica watching over it and recalling how this was a huge adventure for them back when they were kids. As young Riku looks back at the keyhole door, the replica's perspective switches to Riku talking with Maleficent in the castle chapel, which we see after Neverland in KH1. Shortly after, we once again see the replica in the pod, as Vexen says to him, you will become stronger, because whatever power that Hero of Darkness has will be yours. Conversion 35% complete. The scene then switches to SRK musing about other worlds as they hang out at the Paupu tree. After Riku's line where he thanks Kairi, the replica thinks to himself, right, I really liked Kairi, she was special to me, but Kairi liked Sora, I always knew that. The narration says, in that moment he had really wanted to tell Kairi how he felt, but he couldn't do it. The replica then hears a voice say, I'll make it so the girl is yours. When he turns toward the source of the voice, the ocean turned black as ink. The voice asks, what is it that you want? I'll make your wishes come true. As the world fades to black around him, the replica thinks, back then I wanted Kairi to be mine, no matter what it took. I did? No, it was Riku who wanted that, willing to do whatever it took. Everything fades out and things pick back up in Riku's room in Hollow Bastion, where we see Riku resolve to do whatever it takes to get Kairi's heart back. The replica then wakes up again on the beach to another made-up memory of Sora being angry at Naminé for drawing him poorly. So much so, in fact, that he takes her sketchbook from her, rips it into pieces, and stomps on the pieces. Naminé tells Sora that she never wants to see him again. 
we see Riku comforting her before everything fades once more. Meanwhile, Larxene, Vexen, and Naminé look into the replica's pod. Conversion 43% complete. The replica then wakes up in a Castle Oblivion corridor where Sora is running up to him, expressing his surprise at seeing Riku. Their first scene together then plays out as it did in Sora's story, but interspersed with the replica's thoughts, who comes off as something of a passenger in his own body, as his words, quote, tumble out effortlessly. As they talk, the replica thinks to himself, we got separated and we were looking for each other. Something like that? And now we're both looking for Naminé. That was the basic outline. Wait, outline? The narration comments, the way the word outline came into his head made him feel uncertain, but he kept glaring at Sora anyway. When Sora and the replica argue about Naminé, the replica thinks to himself, Sora, you never think of anything but Naminé. I was the same, but you have Kairi, so why can't you just let me have Naminé? Even still, the replica also thinks to himself, why don't I want to see Sora? Why am I so angry? Quote, his heart was full of doubts and questions, but he swung his sword anyway. The scene transitions to Larxene and Vexen looking over the replica's collapsed body in a different corridor, and Larxene scolds Vexen, telling him the replica wasn't ready yet. Vexen responds that since she told him Sora had already made it to that floor, he deployed the replica early. I was wondering why the conversion stopped at 43%. It's because the replica still needed more time to cook, but they had to rush him out. Vexen then states that his memory is still being rewritten, and that they'll have to send him to battle Sora again once the process is actually complete. Our perspective switches back to the real Riku in Chapter 5, titled Rival, which starts with Riku visiting Traverse Town. He recalls visiting the world with Maleficent and meeting up with Sora here, and looks into the small house where he watches Sora laughing with Donald and Goofy. Except actually, we're not with the real Riku, it's still the replica, we're just seeing his programming again and he's watching this old Riku memory. They definitely make it seem like you're back with the real Riku since he hadn't visited Traverse Town in his climb up the castle yet. But once the replica's italicized thoughts show up again, it becomes clear that he's back in his little memory pod. The replica then sees Naminé drawing on the beach again with SRK. She's drawn a picture of the three of them, but Riku asks why Naminé isn't in the picture. Naminé says it's because she can't see her own face, so Riku tries to draw her. It looks bad, but Naminé appreciates it nonetheless. As the replica watches on, he hears shouting and turns to find himself at the Rising Falls to see Riku slash at the beast, who collapses. The replica watches Riku take the Keyblade from Sora, and when Riku raises the Keyblade to the sky, the world goes dark. The next scene the replica sees is Riku running away after his battle with Sora in the entrance hall where he re-meets cloaked Ansem. The replica then watches Ansem possess Riku without much commentary. Afterwards, we see Riku waking up on the seashore in a scene very similar to Sora waking up from his dive to the heart in KH1, only Naminé is subbed in for Kairi. Riku opens his eyes to see Naminé, tells her not to scare him like that, and says he dreamt of some kind of dark thing giving him power. Naminé then asks Riku if she should tell Sora that it's his fault she'll be leaving the island. Riku laughs and asks what she's talking about, saying she's not going anywhere. As Naminé begins to explain, she starts to fade away, and the replica once again falls into darkness. We then see Naminé standing in front of the replica's pod, and as she reaches out to edit more of his memories, Larxene stops her and asks if she was about to mess with his memories on her own time. Naminé doesn't answer and turns back to look at the replica. Conversion 87% complete. Another scene plays out back on the islands, this time with Kairi, Selfie, and Titus watching Sora and Riku spar with their wooden swords. Once again, the replica finds himself in an unending black void, only able to see occasional visions of Sora, Kairi, and Naminé. He then hears a voice telling him he'll wake up soon if he closes the door and comes forward. The replica runs toward an enormous glowing door and tries to open it, and is reminded of Sora and Riku closing the door to darkness at the end of KH1. As the door closes, a rain of light blazes across the sky. As the replica looks up, he sees Riku and Naminé standing on the dock on Destiny Islands, where Riku promises that if one of those shooting stars in the sky hits the island, he'll protect her. In return, she hands him a star-shaped lucky charm. Naminé remarks, They say that if you wear this kind of fruit, you'll never be parted from the one you love. Years seem to pass, and now we see Riku sitting on the islet looking at the charm when Sora asks him what it is. Riku tells him it's none of his business, and thinks to himself that Sora doesn't remember Naminé, probably because he doesn't want to, thanks to the time he tore up her drawings. Sora snatches the charm and runs off with it, but trips, and Riku scolds him. Conversion 100% complete. The replica finally regains consciousness again in Castle Oblivion, clutching the lucky charm. Here's where we pick things back up with scenes adapted from the game, as Larxene is taunting Naminé before the replica steps in to defend her. We then switch over to a scene from Sora's story where he encounters the replica for the second time. Once again, the conversation plays out like before, with a few interspersed lines from the replica's thoughts until their fight concludes. The chapter ends with Naminé clutching her sketchbook, watching Sora and the replica through the crystal ball, as Axel tells her that nobodies can never hope to be somebodies. Chapter 6, Relent, begins with Axel meeting up with the replica after his most recent defeat. Axel says to him, that hero was pretty strong, huh? Even Naminé admits she likes strong guys, you know. 
He asks the replica if he'd like to get stronger and tosses him a blank card, saying it'll help him. The replica asks why Axel's helping him, and the latter replies that he'd like to see Sora get taken down himself. The replica holds the card to the door as Axel watches on. We finally return to the actual Riku for real this time, and we're told that he's made his way through Traverse Town off-page and arrives in a world where lotuses bloomed in profusion, referring to Wonderland. Riku does not recall ever seeing it before, nor should he. He wonders whose memory this world is from as he fights Heartless. We briefly check in on SDG, who have just cleared a floor and are relieved to find that the replica doesn't feel like fighting them. The scene shifts to another moment from Sora's story, this one with the organization members taunting Vexen about the replica's failure and eventually sending him to take out Sora himself. We switch back over to the replica in an original scene of him arriving in Twilight Town, which was supposedly behind the door that he held a blank card up to. Out of nowhere, a blonde boy on a skateboard rides past him, not seeming to notice the replica. The replica chases after him, but can't keep up. Eventually, he comes to the edge of town and notices a big hole in the wall. He moves toward it, wondering if there's anything on the other side. We then jump back over to the real Riku, who's made it through the Lotus Forest and engages in battle with the Trick Master. Once again, we switch back to the Replica, who finds himself in the Twilight Town woods. As he makes his way through, he thinks to himself, Why can't I beat Sora? Why do I want to fight him at all? Because Namine hates him. Namine never wants to see him again. So I have to stop him from finding her. As he makes his way toward the mansion, he actually sees Sora and Vexen facing each other down. Before he can get any closer, Axel approaches from behind. The replica asks how he's meant to get stronger by coming here, but Axel feigns ignorance. He tells the replica to look at Sora and Vexen's battle, and comments that Sora is pretty strong. Axel decides it's time to intervene, as the replica overhears Vexen saying that the Riku which Sora speaks of is fated to sink into the darkness. Axel comments to the uneasy replica that this wasn't in the game plan and moves in to, quote, settle things. With that, the replica finds himself enveloped in darkness and then winds back up in Castle Oblivion, facing Sora down for the third time. We see the scene from Sora's campaign, once again with interspersed replica thoughts. Of course, the replica loses yet again as he questions why he can't win and what darkness he's doomed to sink into. We shift over to Zexion and Lexius commenting on Vexen's demise, which plays out normally. The scene shifts yet again to nominate in the Crystal Ballroom as we get the hell of a show scene one more time. After said line, Axel adds, and you, fake, will set the final act in motion. We then follow Namine as she runs away, before bumping into the replica. He asks her why Sora has the same lucky charm and the same story about a promise if she hates him so much, and Namine apologizes. She eventually reveals that his and Sora's memories are fake. The replica doesn't understand and screams at her in agony, but she leaves to find Sora as he begs her to come back. We rejoin the real Riku, who's made it through Wonderland and finds himself facing Lexius. They have their usual conversation in battle, but as Lexius is dying, he says, This is my strength. I, number five in the organization. I, who was once his favorite pupil. And, uh, press X to doubt. I can't imagine that's even slightly close to true, but whatever makes you feel better, Lexius. Also bear in mind that Lexius' death scene plays out differently in GBA Com versus Recom. In the latter, Riku is nearly defeated, but turns the tables on Lexius when he's possessed by Ansem. In GBA, which the novel follows, Riku wins, and Lexius basically explodes with darkness and sends Riku to the void, where Ansem nearly takes control of him before being stopped by Mickey. As Riku proceeds further up the castle, we switch back over to the replica, who's chasing after Namine while trying to convince himself that she's lying and that only Sora has fake memories. For the eighth and final time, we see the replica confront Sora, and the chapter ends once again with Namine breaking the replica's brain. As Sora calls out his name, the replica thinks to himself, I hate you, why are you calling my name like that? Chapter 7, Rejection, picks up with the scene of Zexion and Axel speculating over who will be the next member to fall, which we actually saw back in Sora's story more than 100 pages ago, despite being a part of Riku's story in the game. We shift back to the replica's half-conscious narration as he sinks into the darkness. He can faintly hear Namine, which eventually causes him to wake up, still in the same hall where he had fainted. By now, Marluxia has come to take Namine, and the replica runs toward the top of the castle. We then switch over to Sora's initial confrontation with Marluxia, as the former states that his friends can help him piece his memories back together. The replica thinks about how nice it would be if he could say the same before he dashes in and attacks Marluxia, resolving that his heart can still feel and care about people. The fight scene then plays out as it did a volume ago. SDG then entrusts Namine to the replica, and they proceed through the door to the final fight with Marluxia. Namine asks if Sora will be okay, to which the replica responds, He's your hero, isn't he? If he made a promise to you, there's no way he'll lose. Namine smiles at him, but the replica can't bear to look at her. It's a smile he knows from his false memories. Namine says to him, Thanks, Riku. I mean, replica, as he stares into space. We rejoin the real Riku, who feels the shockwave of Marluxia's defeat before being met by Zexion, and that scene plays out normally. 
We then cut over to Sora emerging victorious from his battle with Marluxia, specifically on the portion of the scene that focuses on the replica. Eventually, he leaves SDG and Namine, and we then see, for a second time, his meeting with Axel, who asks if he'd like to become the real thing. The real Riku then enters Destiny Islands and meets up with the visions of Selfie, Waka, and Titus, who eventually vanish without a word. Maleficent's words echo in his head, telling him that his heart is steeped in darkness and that he can only see those who exist in that same darkness. Everything plays out pretty faithfully after that. Riku sees the Kairi Mirage and gets lectured by Zexion, culminating in the appearance of Darkseid. They don't really have a battle though, it just punches Riku and sends him flying, and then Zexion shows up as Sora. Everything for the rest of the chapter plays out as it does in the game, from Riku's confrontation with Zexion to Zexion's demise at the hands of the replica. That brings us to the final chapter, Chapter 8, titled Revive. The early portions of it play out pretty much identically to the game. Riku meets up with Mickey, enters Twilight Town, and the fake Ansem reveals himself as Diz. As he progresses through the town, Riku finds no Heartless, and eventually comes to a hole in the wall that leads to the woods. He, quote, could smell something from through there. The scent was tinged with darkness, but there was something else too. Could it be Namine? Jesus Christ. We then briefly shift to the replica's perspective, who's also making his way to the old mansion, as Axel told him that if he went to the place where Vexen died, he would find Riku. He tells himself that surely if he destroyed the real Riku, he could fix the emptiness in his heart. A minor thing I noticed, but the Twilight Town mansion is described as being white, so that's weird, because it very isn't. The two Rikus hardly have a real fight, the replica gives his speech and knocks Riku through the mansion gate, but Riku manages to parry his next attack and tackles him to the ground, holding the Soul Eater to the replica's throat. With that, the battle is over, and we move on to the replica's death scene. For the amount of extra focus the replica received in this volume, he gets surprisingly little fanfare on his way out and barely any changes to speak of. The most we get are some additional thoughts from his perspective as he's fading away, commenting on how the red sky over Twilight Town is a beautiful last thing to see, as well as wondering if Sora will remember him or if his memories will get mixed up with the real Riku. But with that, he fades away and the real Riku enters the old mansion and his meeting with Namine plays out with no substantial changes. Likewise, his next meeting and conversations with Diz and Mickey play out unchanged from the game and Riku enters the door to face Ansem. Unlike in the game, the novel just puts Riku right at the final battle instead of having Ansem taunt him from the beginning and making him run through the Castle Oblivion floor. And so, Riku's battle against Ansem commences. Not much to note, it's the usual type of brief fight scene we've seen in the novel so far. There's a few added lines of dialogue scattered throughout it, but nothing earth-shattering. And that's pretty much it. The chapter ends with Riku and Mickey leaving the castle and retreated to an epilogue titled Daybreak of Star and the Last Evening. Damn, they should have saved that for a game title. The epilogue, as you probably could have guessed, depicts the scene of Riku and Mickey taking the road to dawn at the crossroads outside Castle Oblivion. But after that, we see a boy staring at a setting sun atop a clock tower as he gets a hazy feeling that something is about to change. He hears Pence call his name, and Roxas runs down the tower stairs to meet up with his friends. The end. So, final thoughts, while I do think the KH1 novel was overall a more interesting read in terms of the changes made from screen to page, I also think the Calm novel has higher peaks, namely the additional replica stuff in the third volume. The games spend a little bit of time trying to get you to feel sorry for the replica, but most of us are glad to kill him off after his hellish final boss fight. The novel goes a long way in making him a much more sympathetic character who's just as much of a victim of the organization as our other main characters. Even still though, a lot of the content in those replica chapters were just us watching him watch KH1 Riku cutscenes or sections from the last novel but written slightly differently. The falsified memory segments with Sora, Riku, and Namine as kids were definitely the strongest part of these chapters and probably the most interesting content in the novel. That all being said, I have to at least hand it to Tanemaki for devising a way to fill up the third volume considering Riku's story doesn't even have Disney World cutscenes to take up space. Making the volume just as much about the replica as it was about Riku was a great way to solve that problem. If, for whatever reason, you still want to read the novel for yourself after I spoiled every tiny change and moment of interest, I would honestly just read the third volume if I were you. Which, you can't really buy it on its own if you plan on reading it in English, so I guess you kinda have to get the whole thing. That isn't to say that the first two volumes are bad, they do a perfectly good job at covering Sora's story, I just didn't find myself as engrossed in them as someone who's played through Calm like, seven or eight times between the different versions. Another high point is that I think the writing overall felt less childish. As I said at the end of the KH1 novel video, even if something is primarily primarily intended for kids, the writing doesn't need to be simplistic to still be enjoyable. I think Chain of Memories as a game is a lot more mature than KH1, so that probably lends to its slightly more sophisticated writing style. Uh, I do own both of the KH2 novels, so let me know, should I cover that too? I'd definitely be more interested if there are more significant changes from the game than in KH1 or Com. but regardless of your answer, it probably won't be the very next thing I do. This was my book for the year, I'm good. Back to video game.
Hey, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, if you did, it would mean a whole lot to me if you could leave a like, maybe even subscribe. The like would be huge because uh, I know from a couple of years of doing this now that any any video about a game that's not one, two, or three, especially if it's about a book, probably not going to appease the algorithm or whatever, as well as the more traditional stuff. So it would go a long way if you could just pummel that thumbel. I don't know, I'm sorry. I've, that's some of the worst I've ever said. It was improv. I don't write these before I do them. Appreciate your patience as I worked on this one. Uh, if you couldn't tell from how I'm totally dead inside at the end of the day's video, that one did burn me out a little bit, so I needed some time to kind of uh, re regain my strength. My strength has returned, and uh, I got to making this one. had a lot of fun with it, especially in the, the third act there when I had to kind of uh, cobble together footage for things that don't exist. Uh, I had a lot of fun using the data greeting, so I hope you thought that was neat. If you want to keep up with me anywhere else, that's Twitter, Discord, Twitch, etc. Regularpad.com is your uh, your all-in-one package for all sorts of regular pad related things. And if you really enjoy it and you want to help support the channel and help me make more stuff like this, Patreon.com slash RegularPat is a great, cool place. It's the number one vacation destination for 2023 and all years to come, hopefully. Once again, thank you for watching, stay safe out there, and I'll see you next time.